my latest project is uh, going to be switching out a gasoline engine uh, for an electric motor on my glass crusher and that's what you're seeing right now. Uh, I'll dig this out real quick. Let's try to keep this thing covered up, keep the rain off of it and whatnot. <clears throat> but this is a five horsepower Briggs & Stratton uh, gas engine that uh, I've used for quite a while. Now it's gotten to the point where it it, um, it only runs when it wants to. Uh, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. I've had the carburetor off a couple times, um, changed some seals and diaphragms in it and cleaned it out good, but I still can't keep it running properly. So I was going to get another gas engine for it and upgrade it to like seven and a half horsepower because the five horse is a little bit underpowered for crushing collet. It bogs down pretty easily. I mean it works but it's it's not quite enough power. But I got to thinking about it and I thought I would just instead of putting another gas engine on it switch to an electric motor mostly because then I don't have to carry gasoline and uh, an electric motor for a, any given horsepower rating has more power for reasons I'm not going to get into right now, but um, you get more power output out of uh, an um, electric motor. So this thing's going to go, and, I'm, and I have a three-phase motor for it. Uh, one thing I'll have to do here is I'll have to change the mounting plate, because the frame size on a motor is quite a bit bigger. It comes out to about here. So instead of removing this plate, what I'm going to do is make a new plate and bolt it to the existing plate and then drill the new holes down through the, the new plate. Uh, if you don't know about this glass crusher, this is, I've shown it in a few other videos back probably about 2014 or so. And I've modified it since then. Uh, it sat quite a bit higher, but I brought it, I cut the leg length off on it here a couple years ago to bring it down to a manageable height. But I'll show you the operation here briefly, uh, if you're not familiar with this. Uh, this type of crusher is technically, I mean it's real simple, but it's technically known as a, hortis, a horizontal shaft impactor uh, for obvious reasons. Now what happens is uh, you pour the, you either put bottles in there or just pull the, um, pour rough collet down into the hopper. And it comes down that chute and into this chamber. And this spins anywhere from 1800 RPM on up to about 3600 RPM depending on the size of collet, uh, the range of collet you're trying to make. Uh, so this spins around, impacts the collet, and does a primary crushing of the glass against this surface. This is a hardened steel plate, high Rockwell hardness. And it, as it does that, it throws the glass up through this chamber where it hits a secondary crushing plate. This is also the same kind of hardened steel up here. And some of it bounces back into the chamber to be recrushed, but some of it comes down into this uh, chute and into this chamber I have here where I have a five gallon bucket sitting. Uh, this is a dust collection chamber oh, and I have a hose that runs into here just to keep the dust down around my shop. Uh, it's really crude, you know, but it works for now. Uh, and of course, this whole thing, I have it opened up to keep the, you know, so the water will dry out when it rains. If I close it, the water actually builds up in there like a pool, and it rusts it even worse than if I just, you know, keep it open. At least it can dry out. Uh, and even though it does rust, you know, once you run um, crushed glass through there in about, you know, less than a minute, this whole thing is cleaned up bright silver again, so it's really a non-issue. Um, pretty much that's the operation. Like I said, it's real simple, uh, but it got to the point where it was a huge inconvenience trying to fight with that motor every time I wanted to crush glass. So I think electric's going to be a big improvement. Next thing I had to do is find a replacement motor for this thing. Now it just so happens I had this electric motor laying around the shop now for quite a few years. I've been tripping over it and swearing at it because every time I turn around it would be right there uh, catching me in the pant leg or something with the motor mount. I ha always had it setting up and it would sit there and it would spin on its base and I would always end up tripping over it. 
Uh, this is seven and a half horsepower, but it's a three phase and it is also the right voltage, which is 230 volts, and it's also the right RPM, which is 1725. Uh, that's fortunate because I found it's kind of difficult finding a, a good used motor with the 1725 rating. Most of the time they're 3600. And I didn't want a 3600 RPM running off of a variable frequency drive. Uh, and the reason for that is, is it's, it's better to, to find a, um, a 1725 or an 1800 RPM motor and overdrive it uh, up to 3600 than it is to take a 3600 RPM and underdrive it down to 1800. Uh, I'm not really going to get into the reasons uh, into that too much but uh, I will say that the 3600 RPM motors are what are referred to as two pole motors whereas a 1725 is a four pole motor. Uh, 3600 when you underdrive it since you only have two poles pulling on the rotor there's much more of a chance of the rotor slipping uh, when it's under load but when you take a 1725 or an 1800 and overdrive it you have four poles that are driving the rotor under load so it's not going to slip as much. The only downside of that is you start losing efficiency at higher speeds with four poles. I think it has something to do with magnetic losses or the magnetic field not breaking down quickly enough uh, across those poles as it spins faster so it, it starts to induce some more drag at higher speeds. Uh, I'm willing to live with that as long as I have more power. Uh, there's only a couple things I need to do to this uh, other than greasing the bearings. Uh, but everything, you know, nothing's locked up or, you know, doesn't seem to be any kind of play in the rotor. It's in good shape. Uh, this box here come unattached and uh, I don't think that's a big deal. I'll reattach it somehow. Uh, the other thing I had to do here is, uh, is remove this pulley. Okay, so let's get this thing fixed up, greased up, cleaned up, whatever. Uh, get it ready for the new pulley to put on. Uh, so that set screw there is pretty much locked in place. And this isn't really rusted, so they might have put Loctite on that. Uh, I'm going to put some heat on it and hopefully that will uh, loosen it up. loose. Good, 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 good. That wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. You see here, I just wanted to show you this real quick. If you screw these two sides of the pulley together, see how they get narrower and that causes the V-belt to get closer to the top of the pulley which effectively makes it a larger diameter pulley. Now if you unscrew this, makes it wider. I don't know exactly what belt you run in one of these things, uh, but as, as it gets wider, the, the V-belt goes down in further into that groove and it, it makes this a, basically turns it into a, a smaller diameter pulley and gives you more of a mechanical advantage. This is the same concept they use on some cars now. Uh, they have the CVT transmissions and that stands for constantly variable transmission and basically they run like this only they use a steel um, belt instead of a rubber based belt but they're much like this and this is not a new idea uh, Bridgeport Mills use this to control their spindle speeds uh, snowmobiles have been using this for years but it's an old concept uh, but it works I know they have some issues with it in the automobiles because the belts tend to break. There's a lot of horsepower involved there. But at any rate, um, once they fix that weak spot, I think it's an ideal type of setup. So there's a bit of divergence on what I was talking about, but I figured you'd find it interesting. Yeah, and there's a set screw right on top there. I'll have to remove that one. A little bit of a cheater bar here for this. 
Okay, so this isn't coming off as easily. Uh, at least the key isn't moving. It's frozen place for whatever reason. Uh, so I'm just going to clean this rust off here the best I can with that in place and then um, use a, um, a gear remover, gear puller to try to take this off. Right from McMaster car here, I have uh, a pulley, new pulley, and bushing. Today I was taking some measurements for the new motor mount for the glass crusher and so I set the motor on there on a steel plate to get the position right and I, I got it in position then I started taking my depth measurements or my length measurements and everything was going okay and then I found out and I started doing the width measurements and realized that I have interference issues with this this motor mount and the frame rails. In other words, this bolt pattern here, this bolt pattern here uh, is eight and a half inches between these two slots, give or take a little bit because they allow a little bit of adjustment. Uh, the frame rails, if you measure in between the frame rails, it's also eight and a half inches. So if you would make a flat plate, and drill down through to bolt us on, what would happen is the bottom of the bolts would interfere with the frame rails and they would, of course, they would go through. Uh, to eliminate that problem, what I'm going to do, instead of using a flat plate, I'm going to raise the motor up using some rectangular tubing, uh, which what will, that will raise the whole motor up two inches and give this a whole new surface to bolt to. And that will eliminate that interference problem. Uh, so I come up with a new bolt pattern, got all my measurements, and I have the other piece of uh, steel tubing on the mill now, and I'm going to start drilling that uh, bolt pattern.
Here's the variable frequency drive I got for running that motor. I got this off Amazon. Uh, this is a seven and a half kilowatt unit. And look at the size of that heat sink on the back. That's crazy. So it's capable of handling a lot of power. And it's also kind of fragile too. Uh, that's why I am mounting it. Well, it's susceptible to, you know, it's electronic instrument. So I have to be careful, keep it away from, um, vibration and moisture so what I did is I got this outdoor enclosure for it and this is a fiberglass reinforced plastic box nothing exciting but I mean I had to get something like this that would keep the rain out uh, that gasket in there I hopefully does the job and it has a an aluminum uh, mounting plate on the inside which is nice I could directly mount that in there bolt it in place I can also run some DIN rails in there uh, in case I want to run uh, pre-filters or post-filters. It fits right in there. I don't know where I'm going to put it yet, but it goes right in there like that. And I'm really glad to see that everything fits in there without any interference. Uh, the next thing I need to do is build some sort of mount for this. I can't mount it directly to the glass crusher because of vibration issues. So I need to physically um, separate it from any kind of vibration. I'm, and I don't have any interior walls to mount it to because all, all my crushing equipment is outside unfortunately rusting. Uh, so what I'm going to do is build a post, a pressure treated post to mount this on and uh, that should take care of it.
Okay, I just got it wired and I don't know if the leads are in forward or reverse. Uh, it's really no big deal with three phase. Uh, if you want to reverse the motor rotation, it's really easy. Just switch the two leads. Uh, so I'm going to try it in this configuration. Uh, so let's go ahead and plug this in and uh, see if it works. Okay, it's plugged in and um, okay, there it goes. That's good to know. Let's fire it up and see if this actually does what it's supposed to. That's reading in cycles per second, or hertz. And now it's 60 hertz there, so that motor is running at its, supposedly at its uh, nameplate RPM. Uh, it's supposed to be 1725. I'll do a check on that to make sure. And I have to figure out how to get that um, frequency on that panel from from showing hertz to actual RPM. My other VFD for my screener shows actual RPM and this manual is kind of confusing so I'll have to see. I think it comes with a uh, default ramp up time of like 10 or 15 seconds and I can change all that but I'm not gonna mess with it right now. And the ramp down time is the same. Yeah, that thing's making a lot of noise. My other inverter, my other motor doesn't sound like that. It's completely silent. This is running a lot quieter now. Um, the main reason for that is I greased the bearings. I should say I re-greased them. Now, I had greased them when I was cleaning out the motor, but uh, I wasn't the motor wasn't running at the time, so I don't really think that the grease got into the ball bearings like like it should have uh, So so I started up the motor ran it at low speed pumped some more grease into it, and, and that made a difference I want to do a test run on this to make sure that uh, The frequency shown on here is driving the motor at the proper speed. I'm fairly certain it is but I just want to verify it so I don't uh, end up turning the motor too fast. So let's go ahead and uh, I already have the power to it so let's go ahead and fire this thing up and take it up to 60 Hertz. Uh, 60 Hertz being typical um, the, the typical line frequency here in the United States so it should take this motor up to its nameplate RPM. And you can see it there in the background spooling up Okay, it's at 40 now. Let's take it up to 60, or close to 60. Doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, we're not doing a SpaceX launch here. We're just uh, making sure the motor doesn't go too fast. Okay, that's close enough. So that is our measurement to the nameplate rating 1745 and get 1803 and it's slightly over 60 hertz so it's be expected to be a little bit uh, higher RPM. Now since I'm talking about the photo tachometer, this is the one that quit, uh, had it for about a year, I only used it about three times, went to pick it up one day and it didn't do anything, put fresh batteries in it, it was completely dead, laser still works. Uh, which is nice, I guess, if you have a cat. I don't. Uh, but anyway, I went and bought another one. And it looks like that one's a little brother. But this one runs on a 9 volt, whereas this runs on 4 double A's. So I'm hoping the circuitry inside is a little bit um, longer lived. Let's take us up to 120 RPM, which should be twice the nameplate RPM.
Hoist the nameplate RPM is about 3490 I believe and this is what we are getting 3595 so I'm about uh, 100 RPM 105 over uh, I can live with that uh, the motor can live with it and so now I'm not concerned about it exploding uh, I'm gonna hook up the I'm gonna clean up the glass crusher now hook it up and do a, t a couple test runs on that uh, but it's looking pretty good okay now for the scary part let's crank this sucker up Here we go. That's about 1800 or, or about 1750 there. Not too bad. Good, nothing exploded. All right, now I'm ready to do a test run with some actual glass crushing here. Okay, it looks pretty good. Uh, we've got a lot of fines in here. The bigger stuff will be kicked back out for remilling, but uh, it looks pretty good. It looks like there's a little bit of moisture in this, which isn't good for screening, but um, you know you can still screen it. The nice thing about having a little bit of moisture content is it keeps down on the dust. So, <clears throat> but these paddles don't uh, kick up much dust anyway. So that works pretty good. It didn't really bog down much at all. Um, so I'm happy about that. Okay, so I'll make about another half dozen buckets of that and run them through the screener.
bunch of different grades in here, anywhere from coarse collet down to fine powder. And that'll all get straightened out in the screener. Okay, that's cool. You might be wondering why I go through all this trouble of crushing glass. You know, you've seen the glass crusher, you've seen all the the stuff I've modifications I've made, and you know why do I make a glass crusher in the first place? Well, the reason is is I do vapor blasting here and sand blasting. And one of the products that I use is crushed glass. I use that for the actual blasting. Here's the grade that I use right here. This is one of the things I make. This is what's called minus 60, um, which just means that the, the coarsest grain in this is going to be 60 mesh and on up. I call it 60 to 120 because there's not a whole lot of, um, not a whole lot of grain smaller than 120 mesh in this batch here. This is what I use here. This is for real delicate parts, and it's very fast cutting. It removes ox uh, aluminum oxide tarnish very quickly. Now, when I started making this stuff, uh, I had byproducts uh, that I don't use here. In other words, I had other grades, other mesh sizes. The next size here is 40 to 60 mesh. So this is good for uh, general abrasive blasting, removing uh, rust and oxidation. I don't use this too much, but this is good for removing most kinds of rust. And this is coarser yet. This is 24 to 40 mesh, and this is getting pretty coarse here. This, this has more energy uh, for knocking off uh, heavier scale and rust. It's not, it's not as quick um, as, say, if you're removing tarnish or anything like that, because you're getting less particles per square inch when you're blasting but this will this will really knock rust off that's that's pretty coarse there's a lot of energy in that and uh, that's about as coarse as I go with blasting and here's the coarsest grade I make this is filtration grade now this isn't used for I mean you could use this for blasting I don't uh, but this is filtration grade meaning that uh, this is the stuff that you would put in a sand filter, say for a swimming pool. Uh, I use it in my, well, my vapor blaster has a sand filter that I built for it, and this is what I use in there to filter out. Uh, it's like a primary filter, a high volume setup to get rid of um, a lot of the particulates in, in the vapor blaster. See, glass has a slight electrical charge to it that attracts... Um, particles in the water and then it you know they adhere to the glass and then you can backwash it and reuse the filter and it lasts a long time now these other grades here I don't use them here so I end up selling them on eBay uh, people use this for their swimming pools I ship it all around the country and Hawaii and Puerto Rico and stuff uh, same with these I don't sell that because I use that here I need to keep a stockpile of that. But this stuff I sell on eBay and also this. I, I sell a lot of the 24 to 40 uh, and also the 40 to 60. Okay guys, uh, that is pretty much what I wanted to show you with that glass crusher.